Good morning. Welcome to Threading the Needle. I'm Greg Poole, and my guest this morning is Michael Brockstein. Michael is probably better known, at least uh, uh, among Georgia fans, as Senator Luparski of the blog Get the Picture. Michael and I have kind of known each other for, I guess, since 2008 or 9 when I started, and, and Michael was already a famous Georgia blogger. <laughs> Actually, when did you start, Michael? I started the day after the Georgia Georgia Tech 2006 game. 2006, okay, good. I, I've always enjoyed your work, and so let's put some some more on uh, video right now. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is the uh, the likeness legislation, the name, image, and likeness legislation that. Uh, uh, probably is going to be with us pretty soon. Uh, don't know exactly what's going on right now since this detour to Congress that, uh, that the NCAA has taken. Uh, but um, why, don't, why don't you talk to us just a little bit about name, image, and likeness, uh, Michael, and uh, we'll go from there. All right, well, you know, basically it all goes back to the NCAA's position on amateurism, which is basically uh, from their standpoint, it's uh, antithetical to the uh, college uh, sports experience. Uh, players are expected to play as part of the overall academic uh, experience and uh, money compensation is not supposed to be uh, a factor in that. In fact, it, the NCAA takes the position that it's actually harmful. Um, uh, what complicates things is first off, the NCAA's definition of amateurism is very malleable. It has changed over the years as need be. The most recent example of that being the uh, cost of attendance stipend, which a decade ago, everybody was saying, oh, we can't do something like that. And now it's so common that nobody even thinks about it anymore. Players are being compensated. Really what this gets down to is what's an appropriate amount for players to be compensated. And obviously, the two sides differ on that. I mean, I'm using sides loosely. The players aren't really organized, but we've seen um, a number of lawsuits alleging antitrust violations. And in fact, courts have found that the NCAA has acted illegally as a cartel. That's the, that's that's what's pushing this. Am I not correct? The, if, correct. Would you agree that NCAA would not be considering any of this were it not for its poor outcome in court you know, in federal? Court? I, I think that's absolutely. I think well, that plus what the legislatures are doing now. But yeah, I mean, basically the O'Bannon case, which is the big one that got the ball rolling, was a pure uh, name, image, likeness suit. It wasn't about the schools paying the players. It was about the players not getting anything from the uh, EA Sports game. And so, you know, basically things have just kind of roll, rolled from there. Um, you know, the NCAA feels, feels like their business model is being threatened. So they've taken a, a very harsh stance on what the players are trying to accomplish. The problem they've got now is with the state legislatures uh, and Congress stepping into this thing, uh, it's definitely, led to something at a higher level than what the NCAA was dealing with before. Before it was disorganized players who hired attorneys and, and, and did this. Now you're dealing with politicians and it's a, it's a much more difficult place to go. And the, the big push right now is, is Florida, surprisingly, but their legislation, which is passed, and I believe signed by the governor, goes into effect uh, next July. And so that's, the clock is really ticking hard because of that. And the NCAA has gone to Congress ostensibly because they claim they want, the schools want a, a uniform approach, which I snicker at because there's all kinds of stuff that's not uniform in the world of college athletics that the NCAA and the schools put up with. But anyway, that's what's going on there. I think what they're really hoping for, obviously, is a more favorable uh, forum in which to get some limitations on what players can do in terms of exercising their NIL rights. Okay, so we know that uh, at least we, I think most people suspect there's going to be some type of, of name image NIL 
legislation from NCAA. And don't know when, but you know, within the next year, probably there's going to be something. Yes. Um, how in the world are they going to police it? I mean, it's, it's, I, I know that that's the, that's the booger bear that, that, that everybody raises as to why it won't work. And it, it may be why it won't work. I don't know. But how, how do, I, I know you can always say, well, there's things, you know, there's things going on now. And so we're policing it now. Why can't we police it then? But it is going to be, it, there are going to be levels of complexity rather than just policing, which is going on now. Um, how's that going to happen? Well, I, I assume when you're talking about policing, what you really mean is uh, recruiting yes, that's and, and buying and selling players. Uh, yes. And, and yes. That, that's certainly going to be an issue. Um, but I mean, taking a step back for a second, there's a, there mm -hmm. is a lot of this that's going to impact in areas where recruiting doesn't matter, where paying players doesn't matter. I mean, there's, uh, especially when you talk about women athletes in, in non-revenue producing sports, there's all kinds of examples of gymnasts, for example, that have uh, gotten on social media and, and taken off with viral hits that, you know, that, that would be totally outside of, of, of these kind of concerns. Um, so I think when the NCAA ra and the schools raise the issue about about this stuff, it, it, they're basically trying to just drive drive the whole conversation out of that one particular issue. That all being said, what I'm always amused about this is it's the same thing when I hear the complaints about about tra the transfer portal. The issue with with policing is not about policing players, it's about policing schools. And, you know, guys, if you are so worried about this, instead of just saying we can't do anything about it, how about sit down and try to figure out what you're going to do with regard to recruiting? Uh, you know, I mean, I mean, you can define a booster and you can, you can require disclosure. I mean, they're, it's, they're, not, they're not totally weaponless and they're not totally without uh, ways of doing, you know, things to, to track it. I'm not saying it's going to be perfect because I don't know and I don't know how committed they're going to be to, to worrying about it anyway, but, you know, hold the mirror up to yourselves first and ask, you know, how this is going to work. So, it, like I said, with transfers, the, the, I always keep hearing about poaching. Well, wait a minute, who are the poachers in transfers? They're coaches. Cool. So, you know, sure. If you want to complain about this stuff, about what you're worried about, get your own house in order first, and then after we get past that, if there's still issues, sure, let's figure out what to do. And, and, and you said it in, in that way because some prominent coaches have recently raised that same point that I just did. And it, it, how, how are you going to police it? Of course, we know that, uh, that full cost of attendance, we had this, these same fears with Correct. full cost of attendance. And especially when it was left so that each school sets their own amount to pay a full cost of attendance. They, I remember on my board and I'm sure on yours, people were saying when that was coming about, well, you know, Alabama's going to, if we set it at 4,000, they'll set it at 5,000 and they'll be able to rack in all the players. And to some extent that, that did happen with Alabama. I think theirs was, uh, their full cost of attendance was the highest in the SEC. At least it was at one time. I don't know about now, but I don't think there's been any uh, evidence or accusations of, of, of kids going from one school to the other because of, uh, you know, an additional thousand dollars in, in cost of attendance. So I don't know that that particular thing will be, you know, that we can get you more for your advertising for your NIL value than this other school. I don't think that's, that's going to happen. Uh, the, the whole thing with, uh, with recruiting though could be a problem. I mean, it's, yeah, but I'm going to tell you something, and this is just the cynical part of me. What they're not, you'll hear them sort of hint about it indirectly, but I think what the schools are most concerned about is something we've already seen with what you just talked about with the cost of attendance stuff. It just becomes normalized. I mean, what happened? I mean, the NCAA, it's, it's, hard, it's part of the NCAA's defense against, against these antitrust claims is that paying players would negatively impact the way consumers, us fans, approach the game. What happens if NIL passes, and without too many bells and whistles, it passes and you're seeing players getting Nike contracts or whatever, 
and nothing else happens. The game gets played, the coaches coach, the players play, the fans come, the fans watch it on TV. Because you know what happens after that? When the, when the schools go back to argue, we can't pay players directly because it'll affect the game and the fans won't like it. Everybody's going to yawn and say, what are you talking about? They're already getting paid and nobody cares. That's what I think scares the schools more than anything. Yeah, well, obviously it's going to disrupt the financial model of, of, of college sports, college football, uh, disrupt by this change. Disrupt yes. well, probably is the wrong word. But uh, uh, so what you're saying is it's no big deal. Right, I think it's over. I think it's overblown. Okay. okay, all right. So, what's the timeline? When's this stuff going to happen? In, you know, five years from now, will this be? Will, 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 will I look back and say, "Well, that was a stupid uh, interview because it was all uh, much about nothing." Well, you know, NIL really. I mean, NIL rights aren't going to impact the schools that much. I mean, they're not the ones paying the money. Okay, so, you know, and, and there's, no, so there's no Title IX issues or anything like that. The, the, you know, what's, what's really left to worry about is, you know, how do you handle boosters? And, and I think that's also overblown. But basically, they're gonna have to come up with something by July of next year because Florida kicks in at that point. And the one thing I can absolutely promise you if nothing else changes and Florida's law goes into effect, hell, they'll call a special session of the Georgia legislature if they need to to get, to get the exact same law passed here because there's no way Kirby Smart is going to let Dan Mullen hand out checks or hand out opportunities to earn money in Florida that can't be matched at Georgia. Yeah, well, we all know that's not going to happen. So, right. You know, that's, uh, so, what's, so what you're saying is that the, the long-term – effect of this to the sport to the Georgia fan is nothing. If you want my really sarcastic take, it, it'll be better for the Georgia fan than what happened to Todd Gurley and AJ Green. Okay. Okay. Michael want to say it let's I know this is a short one, but uh, do you have anything you want to add? Anything to sum it up? I think we have we covered everything. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I think it's going to be fascinating to watch because the schools aren't in aren't in the driver's seat on this, and you know, the other complicating thing from what I've been reading is, you know, given everything else going on right now, this isn't exactly a high priority in Congress. No, and that that's another thing the schools have to deal with, and of course, one thing you can tell the schools and the NCAA is they're always going to overplay their hand, asking for an antitrust exemption. Is something Congress was never going to give them, and yet they've spent a bunch of time asking for it, and they're still asking for it. So I wouldn't be surprised if Florida's law goes into effect without Congress stepping in. I mean, I'm not saying that's going to happen, but it wouldn't surprise me. Well, that certainly would be interesting. Yes. It would be time, time to do another interview then. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Michael. Good to see you, and continue. Best of luck with uh, get the picture. Thank you, sir.